So that that victory that is yours, right? When you when you are attacked, when Satan comes against you, you come from the victory. You come from the victory. If you are, if you've got symptoms coming in your body, then you come from the health of Christ because the health of Christ is imbued in you. You are filled with the health of Christ. You're the presence of God is within you. And so you are contagious with divine health. And so you're not trying to, you know, stop the, you're not trying to get this. It you just, it has stopped. It's finished. Like Mike said, poverty, sickness, sin, physical death. It was done at the cross, but you come from the victory of Christ. You are in that finished victory. You are in that, and in that there is there are different levels. So I want to talk today about because if we want to walk in the fullness of the victory, Jesus said, I call you friends. Jesus said in John 15, 15, I call you my friends. That means that you're no longer a slave. You're no longer like sort of like, wait, master, what can I do for you? He says, I call you my friends. So as friends, they know what you're going to do, right? If I can sit down with friends, I share what's on my heart. I share dinner with them. I share heart talks with them. We know we, we discuss things. But if I'm serving an employer or I'm serving someone as a master, that's a completely different relationship. And Jesus said in John 15, 15, I call you my friends. You're no longer my servants. I call you my friends. Now, the interesting thing with that is that friendship is double-sided. I can call somebody my friend, but whether or not they actually reciprocate friendship to me is a different thing, right? So I can call somebody my friend. Oh, yeah, I know them really well. They're my friend. But... Their attitude to me might not be what I think it is. And so we've got to understand that you are, you are established in the victory of Christ. You're established in him, right? You are dead. Like, let's face it, we're all dead, but we're, we're alive in him. He's alive in us. So the thing is, if I'm his friend, I've got to know how to be friendly with Jesus. And I can remember years ago, I would be saying to Jesus, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you. I love you, you know. <laughs> but he said to me one day, he said, you can tell me that as much as you like. He said, but if your actions don't line up with your words, they're just words. Because if you love me, you obey me. And it's not a thing of works. It's being established in a friendship with Jesus. You know, when you love somebody, you want to do things that please them. If you know you've got somebody coming for dinner and they're really good friends, you know what they like to eat. You want to make sure that it's, you know, it, you serve them what they, they like because they're your friends. Or I've got a friend who hates green, like just detests green. I love green. So you know who I'm talking about, right? So when I'm with that person, I don't wear green. Because I know that I'm going to get the whole time, oh, I hate green. I really can't stand. Why, why do you wear green? So I think I love them. I don't need to go into that conversation. I won't wear green when I'm with that person. I love green, though. I love green. But, you know, but that's what we do. When you love somebody, don't you, don't you sort of like make allowances for them? And we, we go out of our way to please them because we love them. So that we can, we can know people in different ways. Jesus said, I call you my friend. But do you know how hard it is to sit with Jesus when you first start off in a friendship and not ask for something? Like, and what do you say, uh, master of the universe, how's your day going? When he's, you know, like he's totally defeated everything, he's totally victorious. Hey, you know, have you had a good day? Well, he's sort of like, well, what other kind of a day is there, you know, in heaven? You know, like... It's a completely different conversation when you start off and say, Jesus, I want to be your friend. I truly want to be your friend, but I'm not quite sure what that looks like from my angle. I don't want to ask you for anything. I just want to really get to know you. I can't ask you about the, did you watch the footy on Friday? Like, I mean, can I ask you about what you thought of the game? Like, I mean, what do you ask him? Like, how do you, how do you get, grow into, it's a process, right? It's a process. Like any relationship, it's a process. So if you think about the people that followed Jesus, there was the enemy, there were the Romans, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the religious, Herod, right? Not impressed. 
don't want to know about him, except he's a pain. We're just going to need to do something about him. But they were the enemy. Then you had the crowd who followed Jesus maybe because of curiosity. They followed Jesus maybe because they'd heard that he'd fed, you know, a whole bunch of people with some food. So like, oh, I'm in for a free feed. Or maybe they wanted to see the miracles. Maybe they needed a miracle. So you've got a whole bunch of people following Jesus for a whole different sort of reasons. Then out of the crowd, he draws 70. And he says in Luke chapter 10, I think it is, verse 1, and he said, I want you to go ahead of me, go two by two, and I want you to go into the towns before I get there and prepare them for my coming. So out of the crowd, he discerns 70, two by two, go ahead of me. Out of the crowd, he discerns another 12. Only these don't go ahead of him, they go with him. Different relationship. So Jesus doesn't have favorites like we think. Because everything with Jesus is, what do you call it, cardionosis, heart relationship, heart to heart. So he has the 12, and they're his disciples, and they become his apostles. And then he says, I've given you the authority, you go and do everything that I do. So he gives them the same ministry. They walk with him. They talk with him. He gets frustrated with them. That's a real friendship when you can actually say, how long have I got to put up with you dense guys? You know, like seriously, how much unbelief is there in you? So, you know, there's, but it's a real honest relationship. So there's the 12, but then out of the 12, there's three, Peter, James, and John. And those three were with him on the Mount of Transfiguration. Those three were with him when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. On particular occasions, he took those three with him on specific assignments. It wasn't, I think, that they were any greater or, or better than the others. I think it was just that they were building a deeper relationship than the others. And then out of those three, there's one, John. And John's the one who leaned his breast on Jesus's head on Jesus's breast the other way around J John leaned across because they don't sit at the table at chairs at a table they kind of recline recline so much easier in tongues they recline around the table and so Peter wanted to ask a question because Jesus is saying somebody at the table is going to betray me so Peter leans across to John who's leaning against Jesus and he said ask him ask him because they knew that John had a relationship with Jesus that they didn't. John had a cardiognosis, a heart relationship that went deeper with Jesus than the others. It wasn't that he was any better, any greater, any brighter. It was just that he had abandoned himself to loving Jesus. And remember, John was the one that they couldn't kill. They had um, boiled him in oil, couldn't kill him, chucked him on an island. He wrote the book of Revelation. I mean, what do you do with a man like that? And I think he lived to be, what, about 100 or something? He lived a long time because, honestly, he wasn't, he just wasn't conducive to death. <laughs> <laughs> but he was the one who had a relationship, although he did say, he wrote it, he wrote it in his own gospel that Jesus loved him more than the others. So we know if you have to say that, he's sort of like, oh, really? But he was the one who put his head, you know, like he reclined against Jesus. He was the one. And we all have that opportunity to be the one. So we can decide whether we're going to stay with the crowd. Or do we want to be part of the 70? 
or do we want to be part of the 12? You think, you know what, the three look pretty good. But I want to be the one. And I want this house to be the one. 